Good morning, church. Welcome, welcome. If you're in the foyer and you're joining us for the second service, why don't you come in and take your seats? There's plenty of them. Come on in. Good morning. You're very welcome to our um, Palm Sunday service this morning. We have uh, Dave Adams coming to speak to us, and I can tell you it is a wonderful sermon. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna start uh, with some some worship this morning. So why don't we stand and we'll pray together before we we start to worship. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for what a great God you are, Lord. And I just thank you for each and every person in this room. And we just pray for those, Lord, who can't make it to us this morning. Um, just, Lord, we pray that you speak to, per to each person in this room this morning. Pray that they'll be impacted by your spirit today, Lord. Amen.
which no one has ever ridden. Untie, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you would imprint your message on our hearts and minds. Thank you that you do not forsake us, as we've just sung. Thank you that you're with us no matter what. And we praise you for this. Amen. As many of you will know, I am awful at languages other than English, and I'm not sure I even speak that one too well. So normally when I'm here, I have to apologize to ancient Greeks and Hebrews for mangling their languages. Today, before I start, I want to apologize to some of you who might be a little bit closer to home. Those of you can speak either Irish or French. Having scored zero out of 40 questions in an Irish exam in fourth year, what I'm about to do does not exactly fill me with confidence. In the past, the Irish television station has used as their advertising, TG Cahar, the Irish television station, has used as their advertising strap line the words Sul Ella. This translates literally as other eye, but maybe a better way of saying it would be another view or another way of looking at things. And I've had a go at looking at things in another way, and I'm still not sure if a pogey moon is a line out or a scrum, and I have not warmed to the music of Daniel O'Donnell. So this morning, I want us to have a look, a Sulella look, at the story of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. When I used to travel to work, as I was traveling down the M50 towards Bray, I could see the sugar loaf in the distance, so I was used to seeing it from the Dublin side. But it also has another side that I seldom see. Same mountain, different perspective. I could have taken a more traditional look at this story this morning and spent some time looking at its messianic overtones, and particularly those verses in Psalms and Zechariah, but we're going to do the, the Sulela thing. So please note that we'll be taking a different look should not negate other perspectives and hopefully might even enhance them. Interestingly, this story appears in all four Gospels, four different viewpoints. We don't have time to look closely at all the narratives, but it might be helpful to look at what some of the passages have in common. So let's look at the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke first, and we'll come back to the, the book of John. All three have Jesus traveling to Bethpage or Bethany at the Mount of Olives. All three have him sending two disciples to a village ahead of them to find a donkey or a colt. All three quote Psalm 118, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, with Matthew adding, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna is a Hebrew expression meaning save. Hosanna in the highest. Mark adding, Hosanna, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Luke adding, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They each end the passages differently. Matthew with the whole city stirred and asking, who is this? This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Mark, Jesus entering Jerusalem and the temple courts and then going to Bethany. And finally, Luke, with the Pharisees saying to Jesus, rebuke your disciples, and him replying, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. The account in the book of John is a bit different, as we might expect, but before I look at it, I want to go on a bit of a detour. We are going to leave the motorway for a bit and take the scenic route. And I'm going to take a drink of this, excuse me. Now, we will, we will return to the motorway no matter how scenic this route may seem so just hang in there i want to talk about the band devo and more t particularly about their lead singer and keyboardist mark mothersball is anybody aware of the band devo 
Uh, like the first service. I listened to really strange music, I think. So they had a minor top 20 hit in the US with the song Whip It in 1980. And that is obviously way too obscure for some and before many of you were born. As you can see from this image, they were a bit out there, not really part of the mainstream. Their leader, Mark Mothersbaugh, went on to write music for TV and film and also for advertising. I came across him recently when he talked about inserting subliminal messages into some of the projects that he had worked on. Are you aware of the idea of subliminal messaging? Inserting hidden words or images that are not consciously perceived but may influence one's attitudes and behaviours. When it comes to advertising, subliminal messaging occurs when an advertiser tries to use images or sounds to influence the audience without the viewers being aware of it. For instance, in an ad for the sugary soft drink Hawaiian Punch, Mark Mothersbaugh inserted the message, sugar is bad for you. A message not exactly designed to increase sales. Now you might be thinking, why can't you just do the job that he was paid to do and not be messing about like this? But maybe you think that this type of subversive behavior is amusing. And maybe hiring an individual that was in a band that looked like Devo might have been inviting trouble in the first place. Mothersbaugh and his bandmate, Jared Casal, say their approach to making protest music came directly out of their, experiencing, their experience witnessing the Kent State shootings where four unarmed students were killed and nine injured by the Ohio National Guard while demonstrating against the expansion of the Vietnam War. Mother's Ball has been quoted as saying that we had come to believe that subversion was the only way to effect change in this country. There is a history of this sort of thing in art. Um, Marcel Duchamp, submitted a urinal to the exhibition of the Society for Independent Artists in 1917 and called the piece Fountain. More recently, Banksy produced a work that self-destructed a la Mission Impossible when a piece called Girl with a Balloon shredded itself after being sold at auction for over a million pounds. But the work I want to look at this morning is this one. It's René Magritte's The Treachery of Images from 1929. And look, I'm already shaking. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. Would anyone like to translate? This is not a pipe. This is not a pipe. We did this earlier on, so we'll do it again. Who thinks that it is a pipe? And who thinks that it's not a pipe? I think Randy McGree felt that it was a metaphor for a pipe or an image of a pipe. But we'll, we'll argue about that later. Dougie, Pastor Dougie, his late father, would have used an Irish technical term to describe this group of artists. They were messers. But they were messers with a purpose. Magritte's works reflects on some of the ideas addressed by the linguistic philosophy of semiotics. And if you need to know more, ask Miriam, um, as this work came up on her course. The other artists are also creatively addressing issues of their day. Okay, I think I can see a ramp coming to get back on the motorway. Before we leave this scenic route, it's okay to forget about the mountains and the sea and that nice cafe and that warm and friendly bus driver and tour guide called Derek. But please remember the idea of symbolism and how it can be used in a subversive and possibly amusing way. Ah, the M50. Okay, back to the book of John and his account of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I think John may have been a Sul Ella sort of guy. One of the things we learned from the series on the book from last year is that he was fond of symbolism. While the other Gospels may start with genealogies or the narratives of John the Baptist, not John. He's straight out of the changing room and dive bombing into the philosophical deep end. In the beginning was the word. That's how he starts his Gospel. And later in the book he uses symbolic images of light, water and bread. So it's no real surprise that his account is different from the others, that it omits the account of the disciples being sent to look for a coat. It is similar in including the verse from Psalm 118 that the other writers use and the verse from Zechariah that was used by Matthew. But his account of the Pharisees has them saying, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. Something is going on here that could be seen as a threat to the Pharisees' world. Before we get, to get back to what could be seen as a threat, I want to think a little bit about parades, triumphant ones. Here in Ireland, parades are a thing. And I'm specifically speaking about Southern Ireland. I'm not going Northern Ireland. We're not going there. 
Once a year in March, we dress up in green, we go out and celebrate, drink too much. And I've also heard of a church where the congregation even dressed in green. So here in Ireland, there is a thing that happens on March the 17th. And back in ancient times, they also had parades. They were a thing. And they were a thing in the Roman Empire. The Roman triumph or triumphus was a civil ceremony and religious rite of ancient Rome, held to publicly celebrate and sanctify the success of a military commander, one who had led Roman forces to victory in the service of the state, or in some historical traditions, one who had successfully completed a foreign war. Its history goes back as far as the founding myth of Rome and the story of Romulus and Remus. The idea of a military parade is something that was common in the Roman Empire, and it was a display of Roman power. But there is another possibility of a triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. And that's been put forward by the scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan in their book about Jesus' last days in Jerusalem, the last week. Love this. Um, only read the beginning bit. I will get to finishing it now this week, hopefully. Um, great book. A little bit more liberal than maybe we're, need, we're used to here. So I give you a slight warning. But this is a fabulous book if you want some um, background to um, Holy Week. They put forward the possibility that while Jesus, down from the Mount of Olives, was entering Jerusalem from the east of the city, there was another military procession entering from the west. Their contention that this parade was led by Pontius Pilate, Roman governor of Idumea, Judea, and Samaria. For parts of the year, Pilate was based in Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea on the sea, which was a new and splendid city, a coastal city, which would have been a much more pleasant location to live in than Jerusalem. A Roman inscription which mentions Pilate was found in the city in 1961. Borgen Crossan's idea is that Pontius Pilate would have led a Roman garrison to Fortress Antonia, overlooking the Jewish temple and its court, to provide reinforcements in case there was trouble in the city during the Passover, a festival that celebrated the Jewish people's liberation from an earlier empire. They ask us to imagine this, and you can close your eyes if you want, but don't do it off. Imagine the imperial procession processions arrival in the city, a visual panoply of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting on metal and gold, sounds, the marching of feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust, the eyes of the silent onlookers, some curious, some are awed, some resentful. There's no biblical account of Pilate's parade, but it is a possibility. But regardless of this, Jesus' entry from the east stands in marked contrast to either Pilate's delegation or a Roman triumphus parade. No cavalry, no soldiers, no chariots, no tanks, no nuclear weapon delivery systems. Let's look at another piece of art. This is Alessandro Turchi's Christ's Entry into Jerusalem, painted by the Baroque painter in 1640. And I'd like to compare this to a more recent work. Can I get some linguistic ass um, assistance? Ce ne pas un entre triomphal. Thank you very much. And um, Barbara tried to correct my French pronunciation, but there really is no point. Um, and I'd like to thank Google Translate for their help um, with, with all of the French this morning, because my French family, who are fluent in French, I sent them a text. Did I get an answer back? No, I didn't. So thank you to Google Translate. This is not a triumphal entry. Is it a triumphal entry? Well, yes and no. It could be argued that the entry into Jerusalem by Jesus on the foal of a donkey was intended as a parody of the display of force and threat implied by the Roman forces. It was prearranged, as the gospel writers have told us. Dictators like to remind their subjects of who is in charge, who holds the power, who commands the armies, but they tend not to like being laughed at, even though sometimes they themselves walk very close to the line that separates parody from horrendous reality. This is a still taken from The Great Dictator, released in 1941. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, I will have to look at my cultural references. Like 1980 was bad, but I know we're getting worse. Derek remembers 1941, though. <coughs> in the movie, 
his first talk, talkie, Charlie Chaplin lampoons Adolf Hitler. Interestingly, Chaplin and Hitler were born four days apart in 1889. I'd show you a video, but we'd, uh, we'd crash the interweb, so you'll have to make do with a, a still of one of the, the film's best scenes. Go and check it out. It's an amazing film, um, The Great Dictator. I was trying to find a picture of a more up-to-date dictator and came across this one. <laughs> Coincidentally and conveniently sitting on a metaphor. If it were not so serious, it does come across as almost comical. It's a fine line between macho posturing and the ridiculous. As displayed beautifully by Greta Gerwig in the Barbie movie, by Ken's interest in horses. To be honest, when I found out that the patriarchy wasn't about hor horses, I lost interest anyway. Jesus comes riding on the foal of a donkey. This does not suggest threat, at least not in a military sense. A leader riding into town on a donkey was a sign of peace, and I'm not sure his arrival was high up on Pilate's to-do list. Someone to keep an eye on maybe, but not a high priority. But there was one level on which Jesus' arrival into the city may have been problematic to the ruling elite. Now I want to take another short detour. This one is going to be really short. We're going to go off on this ramp and we're going to come straight back on on the next ramp because I wanted to talk a little bit about, about that idea of a ruling elite. And I wasn't where, sure where to put it, but we're going to try it here. So the superpower of Rome, as it had done in other jurisdictions, continued its practice of placing local administration under rulers chosen from local elites. In this case, to the temple and its authorities. Mark 14, 53 describes them as the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. The chief priests came from high-ranking priestly families and the elders from wealthy lay families. The scribes were a literate class who worked for them as legal experts, record keepers, and lower level administrators. Borg and Crossan put it like this, their role was to be intermediaries between a local domination system and an imperial domination system. It was a delicate balancing act. Their primary ob obligation was loyalty and collaboration. They were to make sure that the annual tribute to Rome was paid. So it could be argued that Jesus' actions were a threat to this system. John, in um, the book of John, chapter 11, 48, has the chief priests and the Pharisees saying this, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. End of short detour. In 1968, Field Marshal Gerald Templer used a phrase in relation to the Malayan conflict. It was later used with reference to the Vietnam War, and I think I first came across it during the Iraq War. The phrase is this, hearts and minds. Hearts and minds. I wonder if the threat of Jesus' victory is in the area of hearts and minds. The gospel accounts strongly suggest he is winning hearts and minds. Mark, many people spread their cloaks on the road. Matthew, the whole city was stirred. Luke, the whole crowd began joyfully to praise God for the miracles they had seen. And John, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is a different type of parade with a different message. One without threat, but one that offers a joyous invitation to come and follow. To highlight the difference between the two parades, I want us to take a look at something that is not a work of art, but is a work of genius. The put your hands in the air Venn diagram. Now I should go and make a cup of coffee and allow you to absorb some of this, but uh, we don't have time. I want to highlight the fact that bank robbers and mothers tell you to put your hands in the air with a certain degree of threat. And despite the area of consequences in the preacher section, that needs more discussion, I think it's a request when either a DJ or a preacher asks you to put your hands in the air. It's a request to show the joy, the emotions, the love that you feel in your heart and express them physically. Putting your hands in the air is something you choose to do as an act of celebration, an act of worship, like throwing down your cloak or cutting branches to wave. John Lennon claimed that the Beatles in 1966 were more popular than Jesus. So I do not want you to misunderstand the next statement. I am not, N-O-T, N-O-T, not comparing Jesus to a rock star. But I wonder if the mood in the crowd might be a bit like what might be experienced at a rock concert. At its best, 
attending a concert can feel like something bigger than yourself. Joy, the hair standing up on the back of your neck, being part of a community, being part of something that is bigger than you. A very different mood to one where an imperial state has its foot on your throat. Which procession would you like to be part of? Which kingdom do you want to give your allegiance to? That's a question from 2,000 years ago, but still makes, still can be asked of us today. What about your heart? What about your mind today? Jesus calls us to repent and believe in the good news. Repent seems like a very old-fashioned word when we use it today. It has a whiff of giving up your old sins, of being anachronistic of another time. So with the usual apologies to speakers of ancient languages, the Greek word for repent is metanoia. Meta means after, and it implies shift or change. And noia means mind. Shift or change your mind. So repent can mean shift or change your mind. We started with the idea of sula ella, seeing differently. Now we have a challenge to think differently. Borg and Crossan put it beautifully in their book the last week. The roots of the Greek word for repent mean to go beyond the mind you already have. Well, I think there might be a few sermons there in the future. Go beyond the mind that you already have. If those words reach you and you've given up on Christianity or have never even engaged in it in the first place, go beyond the mind you already have. Think again. Sulela. I heard a story this week on a podcast about the escape artist Harry Houdini. When he was due to do a show in town, as a promotional device, he would ask to be locked in a cell in the town, town's jail. And on a visit to Glasgow, he was put into a cell and he had his lock picks on him. So he worked for hours, but he couldn't pick the lock. And he's sweating and he's confused and he's panicking. Is this the first time in his life that he's going to fail? And he leans against the door and it swings open because it's never been locked. The great magician was trapped by his own pre-assumptions, by his own assumptions. Go beyond the mind you already have. Of the term believe, Borg and Crossan go on to say, to believe often means that a set of statements, a set of doctrines is true, but the ancient meaning of believe has much more to do with trust and commitment. To believe, as Mark puts it, is to trust in the news that the kingdom of God is near and to commit to that kingdom. Trust and commitment sound like relationship words to me. It seems that both are important. God wants all of us, our hearts and our minds. The military industrial entertainment complex wants our attention. It wants our clicks. Its algorithms are designed to make our hearts react with anger, the love of likes and the need for a dopamine rush. It's not a time to have your mind's default position set to off. If you're a mind sort of person like me, there can be a danger of getting bogged down with technicalities of the need to be right, to be doctrinally correct, and to put these ahead of being loving, of missing out on a relationship, of missing out on falling in love with the one we seek to follow. I don't know about you, but I often feel powerless. I feel small and insignificant. But we all have some power. We all have the power to choose. We all have the power to choose, unless, of course, you're a Calvinist or a determinist, where you will have to make do with the illusion of choice. We can choose which parade we want to be part of. We can choose which kingdom we want to be a citizen of. We can choose which, which kingdom's value systems we want to align our actions to. I managed accidentally, and can I please put the emphasis on that word, accidentally, to upset one of the seven-year-olds in one of my hockey groups. And if you want to continue sleeping at night, don't upset seven-year-olds. And I brought it home to me just how powerful our words can be to either build up or set back the lives of others. So we have power. We have power in our relationships with those around us, with our families, our friends, our work colleagues, the kids in the playground. I'm, I did this earlier, and uh, I'm trying to do it again. Um, but this week, I lost a friend, um, a 
took a friend who I'm sure was on this platform at some point in the past. Um, he passed away this week and he passed away and he was an alcoholic, which is part of the reason that he died, but he was so much more than that. So, so, so much more than that. Um, and I was at his funeral and there was a sense that had we lost him? Was he, was he lost? And in just thinking about par powerlessness, I think he was powerless to stand against that addiction in his life. And I know we haven't lost him. I know we haven't lost him. I know that God has him because God is the person that has the power. In this passage, the power is on the hill. The power is in Fortress Antonia. The power is up there with the temple authorities. Jesus isn't there. Jesus is with the people who don't have the power. Jesus is with the powerless. That's where he chooses to be. There is this idea that, uh, well, I'm not going to use this metaphor, but it flows downhill. It, in olden terms, it literally flows downhill. You can fill in the metaphor yourself. Jesus is with the people who are in the gutter. That's where he lives. That's where he's with. If you're feeling powerless, Jesus is with you. I know he's with my friend, and I know that my friend Rob is celebrating with him today. I know that he's part of that, that rock concert. He's part of that idea of celebration, and he's part of being with those who are powerless. I'll end with this, and it's uh, one final movie reference. And I've mentioned Barbie, so we ought to touch on the other half of Barbenheimer. Chris Nolan, seven Oscar winner, Oppenheimer. Um, which does contain some 18s type scenes, so please be warned if you're going out to see it. Um, Oppenheimer, as the movie suggests, is about Robert Oppenheimer, the director of the Manhattan Project's Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II, who was often called the father of the atomic bomb. I heard a movie critic this week describe Christopher Nolan's movies as the unraveling of cause and effect, and I think that's a very apt description. At the beginning of Oppenheimer, we have an image of raindrops landing in a lake and the ripples radiating out across the water. Later in the movie, if I remember correctly, we see a world map with the raindrops superimposed over it as if the raindrops were explosions. It's as if the director, Chris Nolan, is saying that there are consequences that will ripple out through time. Consequences for Oppenheimer, both personal and political. Consequences for the planet. With the creation of the atomic bomb, things will never be the same. On Palm Sunday, we were at the start of a week whose consequences will ripple through all of history and have consequences for each and every one of us, for the planet, even for the cosmos. It starts with a triumphal, well, sort of triumphal, entry into Jerusalem, and it ends, well, come next week and see where it ends. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you that it is your power and not our powerlessness that makes it possible to be with you in eternity. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Dave. I think that has given us all, by the silence in the room, given us all something to think about. So at this part of our service, we celebrate communion. And so I just want you to think, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That was us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We celebrate communion so that we don't ever forget that. Humans tend to forget good things, but can remember with crystal clarity all the bad things that happened to them. So we do this, celebrate communion, most weeks, so that we will remember the good thing he did 
he died while we were still sinning and while we are still sinning. He paid the price for you and me because we are powerless. So the stewards are going to come up now. They're going to pass around the bread and the juice. And you have a little bit of time to now go through what's in your head and talk it over with God to get right with him. Go beyond what's in your mind, shift your thinking, and choose which kingdom you want to be part of. So if the stewards would like to come up now.
Good morning slash afternoon. Um, as we come to our time of intercessory prayer, we will learn about another one of our family from the Church in Chains program who has been sentenced to death because of his faith. Ashfaq Massey is 37 years old. In June of 2017, he was accused of blasphemy for saying Jesus was the final prophet and imprisoned. After five years of being in prison, he was sentenced to death in July of 22. Let us now pray for Ashfaq. Father, we lift up Ashfaq to you. Give him comfort and peace, knowing you are with him. Hold him in your hands and guide him through. We pray wholeheartedly that he would be acquitted and released so that he can return home to his wife, Nabila, and daughter. Lord, you are an all-powerful God. We pray that the laws in Pakistan would be changed and that your people would be able to praise and worship you freely there. In this trying time, we pray for hope to exude in Ashfaq and his family. Fill them with positivity that one day soon he will be released and they can be together again. We now turn to our own congregation and DEC family, whether that be in person or our online congregation. Thank you that you have created a family for us here in DEC with so many different gifts in each person. I pray that we would use these gifts in the best way possible, whether that be during a Sunday service or throughout the week. As we continue to assess the building we are currently in and look at our other options, we ask for your help, God. Guide us to the best option where we continue to, con to grow our congregation and spread your word and love to many. Change can be difficult, whether that be rebuilding or moving premises, but help us to see the bigger picture and watch more people come to know you through our church. Thank you that we are able to worship you freely and have the options to grow. I pray for the Bowles family, Lord. We lift Robin up to you. Place your healing hand over him, Father, and bring him back to health. Watch over Margaret as she cares for him and visits him. We pray for the care team in the hospital, the doctors and the nurses, Lord. Help them navigate the best way to care for Robin during this time and bring him home and back to us soon. Father, there are so many people we know going through hardships, whether that be dealing with illnesses, struggling in work and daily life, grieving loss, or just feeling lost. We take a minute now to bring all these things before you, Lord, and give them to you. Thank you that you are a good father who loves each of us and knows us each by name. We strive to be in your image and we will mess up, but you still love us and I thank you for that. Where one or two are gathered, there you are, and God, you are here, so we give these prayers to you in your precious heavenly name. Amen. So that brings our service to a close today. Um, there's an awful lot of up and down them, aren't there? I think I've got my 10,000 steps in at least. Um, now, Margaret would like us to pass, we'd like to pass on her thanks for your prayers. Um, Robin is a bit brighter today. She has got many, many messages. She can't respond to all of them, but she just asks you to keep on praying and she will respond as best she can. Um, I'm going to give you the announcements. Now, pin back your lugs because there's lots of them. So here we go. All right. This afternoon at 3 p.m., um, our Young at Heart Tea Party will be taking place. Um, I had to ask Chat GPT for a nice way to say older people. So our seasoned church members will be here for Tea Party at 3 p.m. today. Um, our Easter services. Okay, so Good Friday, which is in five days' time, the 29th, we are here at 10 a.m. And then on Easter Sunday morning, there's a dawn service at Kill Abbey at 7.30 a.m. at Dean's Grange. And Easter Sunday, we're back here again for the usual times at 10 a.m. and 11.45. Now the clocks go back next weekend. So if you don't want to be the one, the clocks go forward next weekend. So if you don't want to be doing the walk of shame up here an hour late where everybody can tell that you didn't put your clock forward, then remember to do it on Saturday night. Now the service here on the 7th of April is going to be slightly different. Um, instead of a sermon, we are going to be giving you some feedback on what the building survey that Kira referred to. 
and um, we're going to be bringing you up to date on what that's all about and we're going to be launching our new life groups that are going to be uh, running from April through to June to give you some information. So that service won't be live streamed, um, just so you know now, if you're still awake. So the survey for the building project closes on Friday. If you haven't put your opinions in via the QR code, then please do today. Um, you've got up until Friday, but then it will be closed. Um, there are some paper forms left at the welcome desk, but not very many, so get in there if you want one of those. And there are suggestion boxes, both in the foyer and the sports hall, for you to post really anything you want in there. Um, any suggestion you might have about the building project or anything else. You can also get in touch with us at email by at info at dec.ie. No, I oh, forgot there at the end. Okay, so if there's anything, if there's anything that's cropped up today from the stuff that we've been talking about, that Dave was talking about, and you need some prayer, the prayer ministry will be over here at the end of the service. There's also, they meet together on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. if you want to come down for that instead. So, please, let me pray for you as we finish. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace for this week ahead. So please do stay for tea and coffee and a, a good old chat out there, but I'd get there quick because the biscuits go very fast. There's Jaffa cakes and they're very popular. So thank you so much and we'll see you next week. <laughs>